Alex, finally you called. I was missing you. And why is it so dark? I have a headache. I'm trying to rest. You look sick. Are you alright? I'm fine. Just haven't been able to sleep. Don't worry about me. Well, at least now you have some privacy. How do you like the new place? It's alright. Alex, are your friends over? No. I think I saw someone. Meg, not feeling well. I'll talk to you later. I don't know what you want, but please, please, just leave me alone. About four months ago, Alex landed an internship at BII Tech in New York City and moved here from his small town of Blackbird, Delaware. But Alex wasn't alone in the Big Apple. Two of his school friends, Kevin and Caleb, lived here. But although he and Kevin were close, things have been a little shaky with Caleb. From their school days, Caleb had always been a little jealous of Alex. And even now, the jealousy was quite apparent. Welcome to the Big Apple, dude. Hey guys. Congrats on the job. So, you got a place to stay? There are a lot of cheap motels around here. No, I... Stop it, dude. Why would he stay at a motel? He's staying with me. After arriving to New York, Kevin insisted Alex stay in his apartment till he got a place of his own. Here's my humble abode. It's small, but trust me, this is as good as it gets in New York. Hey, so you are the best friend Kevin keeps prioritizing over me, Alex. Uh... Rachel, come on. I can't even talk to my friends. You never want to give me any time. Right. Alex, this is my girlfriend. Rachel, welcome home. So, Alex lodged in Kevin's living room. While he joined work and tried to keep to himself. Not wanting to trouble Rachel or Kevin. But it was soon he realized staying here was impossible. Rachel was very nice, but she and Kevin were either always arguing and if not that, they were going for it. What the? Why is it so dark? Not again. So Alex started apartment hunting. It was difficult getting a place in New York, but fortunately, he found a broker who got him a good deal. But the cheap price had a catch. The apartment was far and isolated and practically trashed. Caleb, I got this offer, but I don't have enough for the advance. You think you can help out? How much do you need? 1800 I'll pay you back as soon as I can. Despite the rivalry, Caleb helped out Alec. He moved in the next week and invited everyone for a little housewarming party. Caleb walked in, looking around at the broken walls, the rusty cabinets, and creaking floorboards. 
Nice place. Suits you. Nice place? This is literally a ghost house. Hey, you know what? We should play a Ouija here. That's so childish, I'm not playing. Oh, come on, don't be so uptight. It'll be fun. But we don't have an Ouija board. So what? Who said we need one? Any one of you got a pocket knife? Alex tossed his knife to Rachel. And she carved out the letters on the floor and folded up a planchet with a piece of paper. Turning off the lights, the friends all gathered around. All right, me first. Are there any spirits here? There was no reply. Is anyone there? This time, after a moment of waiting, the planchet suddenly moved, spelling C. All right, which one of you knows Spanish here? Well, I picked up some Spanish from a coworker, but this wasn't me. Sure, senor, let's try again. Whoever is there, do you like your new roommate, Alex? Seriously, Rachel? But the planchet began moving again. Alejandro, amado tu eres mi amor. The guys all let go of the planchet, creeped out. But Rachel began laughing. Alejandro? Good one, Kevin. Rachel, I didn't do it. Of course, because it was Rachel. What? I don't even know Spanish. Whatever it was, it was bogus, Alex said, turning the lights on. I'm starving. You guys want to order pizza? That night, the friends chilled for a while and around 12, called it a night. Alex bid them farewell and finally decided to go to bed. But as he turned off the lights and passed by the Ouija board, he felt a little strange. Alex shrugged it off and went to bed. But from that night, things only got stranger. The building was only two floors. Alex was on the second floor, and an old woman lived on the first floor. It was always quiet, a lot of sound or movement. But for some reason, Alex never felt alone. Was that the wind? What is going on? this happening? At first, Alex supposed it was just the broken down creepy apartment that was playing tricks on his mind. So the next weekend, he invited everyone over hoping it would brighten up the place. Where's Rachel? You know how girls are. We got into a fight. Don't know how long this one will last. Let me guess, a night? What? Nothing. So, when are you paying me back? This week's salary went to the rent and groceries. I'll try to pay you next week. I knew it. You're going to be one of those freeloaders. Embarrassed, Alex suddenly fell quiet. But Kevin quickly spoke up. 
freeloader? Have you forgotten how he supported you when you came to the city? Yes, and I paid him back. Dude, why are you so... Just about when an argument was to begin, suddenly, the electricity went out. What happened? Electrical issues. I'll go check the main panel downstairs. I'll go with you. Don't pay attention to him. He's just jealous. I told you not to borrow money from him. You could have stayed with me. It's alright, man. I should have paid him back first. No, dude. It's not right. Just as Alex and Kevin reached the first floor, ah! suddenly, they heard a loud scream outside, followed by a heavy thud. Was that Caleb? Alex and Kevin rushed outside to see Caleb on the ground. He had fallen from the fire escape. Dude, how did you fall? My leg... I... I saw someone. There was something. Someone? He's bleeding out. We have to get him to the hospital. Alex and Kevin rushed Caleb to the hospital. He had fallen unconscious. But, fortunately, the doctors were able to treat him. You're awake. You're lucky you fell from the second floor and must have slipped in the dark. I don't know what happened. Where's Alex? He went to get some meds. Oh, there he is. Seeing Alex walk in, Caleb fell quiet. How are you feeling? If you didn't bring me in time, I wouldn't have survived. That's what friends are for, man. Alex, I'm sorry about last night. I don't know what got into me. Leave it, dude. No, the truth is, I always liked Meg, but I guess if Meg chose you, I shouldn't hold a grudge against you. After many years, Caleb and Alex patched up. But returning home, Alex couldn't forget the one thing Caleb said that night. There was someone, something. Alex knew what had happened. The same thing that had been happening with him all this time. There was a presence in the house, and whatever it was, it wasn't good. It didn't want good. After that incident, Alex didn't invite anyone over to the apartment again. But instead, the toll fell on him. Every night, he felt something watching him. How did this happen? He started having nightmares and couldn't sleep. And when the entire week passed by like this, he started to get sick, hardly able to focus. And today, even Meg had noticed whatever it was. Alex looked into the empty hallway, but he knew he wasn't alone. He couldn't go on like this anymore. He couldn't live here. The next day, Alex met up with the broker. I need a new place. I can't stay in that apartment anymore. Why? What's the problem? Everything. The roof leaks, the walls are broken, electricity issues. I want to move as soon as possible. Alright, I can try, but you're the third person who's left this apartment. Third? What happened with others? Well, it all started after the incident. The apartment was initially rented out to a young foreign woman from Mexico.
named Leticia. She and her boyfriend were living here together, but both were nothing but trouble. The young woman was a dancer at a nightclub, and her boyfriend was into all the wrong business. Gambling, drinking. There used to be complaints of them constantly fighting, creating havoc in the apartment, trashing the entire place. I've been working day and night at that club, supporting you. And you've been cheating on me? Stop making a big deal. You knew this relationship was never real. Women like you are only meant to be used. Get out of my apartment. But since the landlord didn't live here, the question of eviction never rose. Until the day Leticia was found lifeless in the apartment. Her body was three days old. Police suspected her boyfriend, but the man was never found. He simply went missing. After that, no one rented the place for the longest time. But when the news had settled, a few people moved in, but they all left saying there was something wrong. They saw things, heard things, as if the place were haunted. When Alex heard what the broker had to say, he felt anxious. Now he had no doubt about what he had been experiencing. I can't live here. Even if I have to, I'll move back to Kevin's. But not here. Alex called up Kevin again and decided to lodge at his place till he searched for another apartment. But that evening, as he was packing up, the bell rang. Alex opened the door to a bouquet of flowers and a familiar voice. Surprise! Meg, what, what are you doing here? All right. Now, I expected a better reaction. I was missing you so much, so I decided to drop by. As Meg walked in, Alex couldn't help but feel the anxiety even more so. He had never told her what happened, and he didn't know if she would believe him. And now, Alex feared something bad would happen. But what would he do? Where would he take her? Without much choice, Alex canceled plans and had to stay back. That night, as Meg lay beside him, Alex lay wide awake, expecting the horror. But strange as it was, the night was silent. The next few days went by, and nothing happened. It seemed Ever since Meg came, everything returned to normal. Alex sat out in the fire escape, looking out into the city lights as Meg joined him. Are you going to tell me what's been bothering you? It's nothing. I guess it was just your absence that was haunting me. Don't worry, Alejandro. I'll never leave your side, mi amor. As the words escaped her lips, Alex froze, turning to look at his girlfriend. Alejandro, amado tu eres mi amor. No. Click on the subscribe button and check out more awesome videos on our channel. And don't forget to press the bell icon because you know it's interesting.
Stephen Woodrow is a young, successful entrepreneur, running his own business in Boston, Massachusetts. He was quite well-to-do, had his own house, a nice car, and was simply enjoying his life. Recently, Stephen has been dating a beautiful young woman named Vivian. She was everything any man would want in a woman. She was smart, independent, entertaining, and gorgeous. The romance sparked almost instantly between them. And their relationship was progressing rather fast. The winter break was coming up, and on Stephen's insistence, he and Vivian were planning on a small vacation. So where are we going? I was thinking instead of somewhere big, let's go somewhere quiet and peaceful, where we can spend time together, just me and you. Sounds nice. I actually know the perfect place. I have an outhouse in Greenville, Maine. It's a beautiful small town. There's a big lake. It'll be fun. Vivian was excited for this small adventure. To this secluded town, it would be different. Early Saturday morning, the couple set out, and after a few hours of driving, they reached Stephen's outhouse in Greenville late in the afternoon. However, Vivian wasn't too delighted about their vacation anymore. She had thought they would go somewhere warm and nice, and instead, this place looked like a deserted small town, and the weather was near freezing. Wow, just love the fresh air here. Really, Steve? We came here for vacation? When you said isolation, I thought it would be only us, but there's literally nothing here. It's not as bad as you're thinking. Trust me, Viv, you'll love this place. I have a friend here who owns a restaurant by the lake. Let's go there for dinner tonight. It'll be fun there. All right. After dropping their things and freshening up, the couple took a small drive and reached an open restaurant by the lakeside. But it was absolutely empty. This is what you call fun? Are you sure this place isn't closed? It's actually very beautiful here in the summer. But in the winter, I'm guessing we'll have to buy sandwiches from a deli, if there is even one of those around here. As Stephen looked around trying to spot anyone, Vivian noticed the bridge that went only a distance above the lake and stopped. Steve, what kind of bridge is that? Don't really know, but it's always been there like that. Suddenly, they heard a voice from around the restaurant. It was Selena. Steven? You? What a surprise! Selena, hi. Uh. Vivian watched as Steven froze for a bit, just simply staring at the woman. He didn't move his gaze from her. This is my friend, Vivian. You mean girlfriend? Vivian awkwardly smiled at Selena. Hey. Just then, another man joined them, bringing in a bucket and placing it on the counter. Steven, dude, seeing you after a long time. Yeah, man, was here in Maine, thought I'd drop by. And you brought a guest this time. Yeah, this is Vivian, my girlfriend. We thought we'd come on vacation here, spend a few days in peace and quiet. But is the restaurant closed? Well, business is good in the summer, but people don't really come in the off-season. So yeah, the restaurant is closed for winter. But Selena and I usually fish and fire up the grill back here. I hope you guys like salmon. You have to join us tonight. Sure, sounds great. 
Awesome. Why don't you and Jake start up the grill? And Vivian? Selena ushered Vivian to one of the tables and took out the fish. You think you can help me prepare the fish? Um, yeah, sure, Vivian said rather reluctantly as she took the knife from Selena. I'll grind up some spices while you're at it. Vivian took the knife and started poking the fish around. She actually didn't know how to do this, but what choice did she have? She was never listening to Stephen again. Vivian pushed the knife into the fish, when suddenly it slipped. Ouch! Celine dropped the lemon and hurried to check. What happened? I think I cut myself. Drops of blood splattered onto the board as Selena grabbed some tissues for Vivian. How did you get cut? The knife wasn't even sharp. Seeing what happened, Jay quickly ran towards the restaurant. You're more likely to have accidents with a blunt knife than a sharp one. Hold on, I'll get the first aid kit. As Jake got out the first aid kit and dressed Vivian, she watched as Stephen and Selena got talking by the grill. They were laughing and smiling at each other. Stephen didn't even bother checking up on her. Seeing the look on Vivian's face, Jake chuckled. I know how you might be feeling, but don't mind them. They've been childhood friends. Stephen actually used to have a crush on her. That night, the four sat round about the table in the cold breeze of the lakeside as they had dinner. Later, they put on a bonfire. But Vivian simply sat there quietly as Stephen and Selena talked. Last time you were here, the boat ride was nice. Maybe we can do that again. Yeah, save you from drowning in the lake again? Please, I was doing just fine, hero. Vivian felt like the third wheel. It was late around 10 that she had just about enough. Steven, I'm not feeling too great. Can we go home? Yeah, sure. Why do you look so upset? Is everything okay? Oh, so you finally remembered me? What are you talking about? Steven, why did you really bring me here? So we can have some alone time together. Out of all places, here where your crush that you are clearly still hung up on lives married to your friend, why? so you can rub me on their face? It's not like that, we're just close friends. Close friends? How do you even know these people? I thought you grew up in Massachusetts. I... I can't remember. Oh, so now you can't remember. Maybe that's why you were flirting with her all night, right? Ignoring me? Don't think I'm stupid, Steven. Come on, Vivian, don't ruin the vacation. I'm not ruining anything. It's you. You ruined everything when you made it about her. This vacation was supposed to be about me and you. But you know what? I don't want to be here anymore. Stephen was shocked seeing Vivian pack up. Viv, don't do this. We were supposed to stay for a week. We haven't even gone hunting or hiking in the woods. Right. So you can dwell in the past once more? No thank you. Vivian angrily continued to pack. Vivian, it's snowing out. The weather is only going to get worse throughout the night. How are we going to go? I don't care. I'm not staying here. All right, fine. But please, at least let this night pass and tomorrow we'll drive back. Vivian gave Stephen a harsh glance before she set up her alarm for early the next morning and lay down in bed. Babe, listen to me. 
Vivian turned the other way and closed her eyes, listening to the winds howl. Stephen, too, laid down and sighed. He soon fell asleep. But sometime into the night, as he shifted in bed, he realized Vivian wasn't beside him. Did she leave? Worried, Stephen quickly put on his jacket and took his gun before he stepped out. It was 2 a.m. Where could she go at this time? Stephen noticed the car parked in the driveway, so she couldn't have gone back. Vivian? Noticing footsteps in the snow behind the house, Stephen started following them. Vivian? It was snowing heavily out. Stephen trudged through the piercing winds when he suddenly spotted a figure. Vivian? Stephen was bewildered seeing her condition without any clothes, the temperature and the negatives. He immediately took off his jacket and ran to cover her. Vivian, what happened to you? She looked dazed. Stephen shook her. Vivian looked at him, suddenly confused. Stephen, where am I? How did I get here? It's... I'm cold. Let's go inside. Stephen brought Vivian in and wrapped her in blankets. He went to get some hot cocoa to warm her up. But when he got back, he found her asleep. Stephen decided not to bother her, but he could barely get any sleep that night. The next morning, when he got up, he found Vivian out in the patio, sitting and watching something. Viv, I made breakfast. Then we can get going, all right? You know something? I like it here. Let's not ruin the vacation. Stephen and Vivian had their breakfast, but she was awfully quiet. Later that morning, the snow began to pour again, and the couple decided to stay back. Stephen chopped up some logs and started up the fireplace watching Vivian every now and then. She simply sat by the window, staring out into the woods. Stephen couldn't understand what happened to her last night, and why was she behaving so strange all of a sudden? Did she go out into the cold and get hypothermia and take off her clothes? Did she get brain freeze and get amnesia? The snow continued to pour all day. Sometime around 10, Vivian offered to cook and had her dinner early and went to sleep. Stephen, however, couldn't sleep at all. He was up thinking about what happened. He paced around the house, he made some coffee. He stood out in the patio for a while and finally around midnight, he came back into bed. However, he was still wide awake. Sometime around two again, Stephen noticed Vivian get up and walk out. Where is she going? Stephen slowly got out of bed and followed her. Wearing just her pajamas, she walked out into the cold. Stephen watched as she walked towards the woods. He followed her, realizing she was taking the shortcut to the lake. But how could she know about this route? 
He had never told her. Stephen was absolutely shocked. It was freezing cold, but Vivian seemed not to react at all. Within about half an hour, they reached the lakeside. Where is she going? Vivian continued to walk to the bridge, where Stephen suddenly noticed two people. It was Jake and Selena. As Vivian was to walk up the stairs, Stephen ran to stop her. Jake, Selena, what is going on? Vivian, stop! But it was as if Vivian was in some sort of trance. As Stephen went to get hold of her, Jake pushed him back. You're not worthy to step on these stairs. Stephen stumbled back. Watching Vivian take off all her clothes as she reached the top, he suddenly saw a figure appear in front of her, waiting for her. The devil? Vivian, Vivian, no! And in an instant, Vivian vanished with him. Vivian! About four years ago, Stephen had come to Maine to buy an outhouse in this scenic small town. It was then that he first met Selena and Jake at their lakeside restaurant. Stephen had a casual dinner, but he was unaware that Selena had spellbound him into falling in love with her, and then through her relationship with Jake, instigated extreme jealousy in him. Selena and Jake were worshippers of the Dark Lord, and they offered sacrifices to him by presenting him with new brides. Under Selena's spell, Stephen was prompted to take revenge on them out of his jealousy for her. And every season, without even realizing it, he searched for the perfect girl and brought her back to Greenville where Selena and Jake charmed her. And offered her to the Dark Lord. And every time the ritual was complete, Stephen would forget and soon be off to find for them a new bride. And the circle of sacrifice would never end. Come on guys, let's go chill somewhere else. I'm fed up staying in these crowds, I want some peace. You want isolation, peace and quiet? I know the perfect place. Click on the subscribe button and check out more awesome videos on our channel. And don't forget to press the bell icon because you know it's interesting. Dad, take me out of here. Dad, help me. Take me out. Valerie, hold on. Dad, help me. Let me go. Please, let me go.
Stand back, Valerie. I'm gonna break this open. She hasn't spoken a word in almost 10 years now. Not a smile, not a frown. I've known the family since she was a child. There wasn't a girl more jollier than her. How did this happen? Doctors say she got frightened by something, caused her to go into shock. Harold's been having a hard time getting a caretaker after the last three left. Three of them? Why did they leave? People just don't have the heart these days. Thanks so much for taking up the job. Always happy to help Miss Dorothy. Christine recently joined this home care service to volunteer as a caregiver as part of her medical training at, at nursing school. Picking up her patient file, she left the head nurse's office to prepare for her visit to a 16-year-old girl named Valerie Cullen. The trip to the Cullen's house was a rather long one. Valerie lived with her single father, Harold, at the far end of the neighborhood. Have a good day, mister. The minute she reached there, she could tell they needed help. The house was beautiful, but now uncared for. A few minutes into ringing the bell, the door was answered by a middle-aged man, probably no more than his 40s. Christine had expected him to be much older. Hello, I'm Christine Jameson. Miss Dorothy sent me for Valerie? You must be Mr. Cullen. Yes, come in. Harold took her down the hall to the room at the farthest corner. Christine could see a young girl sitting quietly in her wheelchair in the dark. Dorothy must have explained everything to you. Yes, she has. I was hoping perhaps we can begin therapy. Ten years. Ten years have passed and nothing has worked. As Harold's watch suddenly sounded, he looked at Christine. I have to go. Feel free to use what you need around the house. With that, Harold picked up his coat and went out the door, leaving Christine practically all alone. Christine stepped into the dark room and kneeled down in front of Valerie. Her eyes seemed almost lifeless. Christine raised her finger and moved it across but Valerie simply stared on ahead. Nonetheless, with a smile, Christine said, I know you're there. You can hear me. I'm Christine. I'll be taking care of you. And I promise, things will be better soon. With that, Christine got up and pulled open the curtains. The darkness suddenly brightened into the room of what seemed to be of a five-year-old girl's. He hasn't changed the room since she fell ill. After caring for Valerie that morning, Christine sat her by the balcony for some air. While she looked around the house, there were tons of small antique showpieces in the living room. Christine had heard Harold had an antique shop. She looked at a picture of Valerie. It was from when she was five years old, laughing as she was playing with the music box, the cuckoo clock, the toys, he kept them all these 10 years. What happened with Valerie? In the next few days of coming to the Cullen household, Christine noticed how isolated and alone Harold was. Perhaps depressed. So she would try to ease things for him. She would clean up the house and cook dinner for them. Mr. Cullen, the weather is quite chilly today. Would you like some coffee? No, you can close the door on your way. But Harold stayed to himself in a study. However, it was one of these days Christine heard him speaking in the room. Please, please give her back to me. Who is he talking to? Christine curiously peered through the door to see him standing to the corner of the room in front of an old armoire. Is he praying? 
in the next few days, Christine often noticed him speaking on his own and spending a lot of time just staring at the old armor. What is it with that armor? Do you know, Valerie? Why is your father so harsh? Come on, follow my voice. I guess I'll have to find out myself. It was one of these days while Harold was out at a shop. Christine went into the study again and stood in front of the armor. It was broken. He repairs almost everything. Why not this? She pulled it open to find it empty inside. Nothing but the glare of dust. Christine quickly went to Harold's desk and found a screwdriver. This should do the trick. But just as Christine turned, she froze seeing the armor closed. Did I close it? As she held the handle to open it again, suddenly it got stuck. What is it stuck with? As she tugged onto it, all of a sudden, Christine's eyes fell upon the small gaping hole on the panel. She fell back as she screamed out in fright, and the armor flew open. Before Christine could figure what happened, Harold rushed into the room. What happened? There, I saw, I saw someone inside. It was staring at the open armor. Harold fell quiet. What are you doing here? I, I was just cleaning up. Stay out of my study. I'm sorry, but I really saw... You mistook something. Please leave. Hearing his harsh tone, Christine left knowing she was the one who was prying here. But ever since that day, she got curious to know what she saw. Who does your father talk with, Valerie? Is there something he's hiding? And what did I see? Despite Harold's warning, the next time he was out, Christine couldn't help herself but to go back. Did I really mistake something? After staring at the old armor for what seemed like forever, Christine sighed as she turned to leave. It was just then that she heard a faint laughter, the sound of footsteps scurrying off. Christine turned to find the armor open again. Who's there? She immediately rushed to the armor and looked behind it, around it. But the room was empty. I'm sure, I'm sure I heard a voice. Christine froze, seeing something flash before her eyes. Frightened, she left everything be and left the room. I don't know if anyone will believe me, but trust me, Valerie. I saw... I saw a little boy. I can't tell your father I was snooping around in his study again, but... But I know he's hiding something. What do I do? How are things going? It's been alright, but... But what? Has something happened? Trust me, Dorothy, I'm not making this up. I really saw it. Saw what? There's this broken armor. I've seen Harold speaking in front of it. And I heard things. I saw a boy. Listening to Christine, the look on Dorothy's face changed. The last nurse said the same. The same? Dorothy, I know there's something Harold's not telling me. What happened to Valerie? What is it with that armor? 
Look, Christine, I didn't want to scare you off. But believe me, things weren't always like this. Harold and his wife, Amelia, moved here almost 20 years ago. We used to be neighbors. That's when he first opened up his antique shop, and they were doing well. When Amelia got pregnant, they were the most happiest couple. But after she passed away, Harold went through tough times. He was very attached with his daughter. Oftentimes, he would take Valerie with him to the shop and stay there. Wow, Dad. This armor is so pretty. This wardrobe is so pretty. Can I keep it? Please, Dad, can we take it home? Harold would buy these antique items from auctions in various places, repair them and sell them at the shop. But that armor, he kept for Valerie. My name is Valerie. What's your name? Johnny? What are you doing in there? Come out. Don't be scared. Valerie, who are you talking to? My friend Johnny. Yeah, we play hide and seek together. But he always hides. Harold overlooked the matter. Kids have imaginary friends. But soon, things started to become strange. Valerie, where are you going with your food? Johnny's hungry, Dad. Don't be silly, I can't stay in here. Hold on, I know what you can do. I never feel alone when Teddy is with me. You can keep him. As the days went on, instead of getting over the strange little games, Valerie seemed to get obsessed with the armor. Every morning, Harold would find her inside. It seemed she was awake the entire night. Valerie, where are you? Did you sleep here the entire night? Johnny doesn't let me sleep. All right, Valerie, that's it. You can't play in here anymore. Harold locked up the armor and thought Valerie would whine a couple days and soon get over it. It was better than her falling sick. Johnny, are you crying in there? I'll open it. Take me out of here, Dad, help me! When Harold heard Valerie shouting, he rushed to the room to realize what she had done. Valerie, hold on. But as he tried to pull the armor open, he couldn't. It was as if something was holding it back. Dad, take me out. Let me go, please, let me go. The moment he heard a strange voice and the sound of his daughter's scream, Harold knew something wasn't right. Stand back, Valerie. I'm gonna break this open. Harold broke the armor to find his daughter laying unconscious inside. Valerie! Valerie! No one knew what happened that day, but Valerie's been like this ever since. It's almost as if 
she's soulless. After listening to what Dorothy said, Christine was baffled. Johnny, did Valerie see the same little boy? Was it a spirit? Christine couldn't forget what she heard and saw herself, and she had to know more. Harold got it from an auction. There must be some paperwork. Inspecting the armoire and looking through all of Harold's things, Christine soon found a receipt file dated back to 1990 when he had bought it. Gillenhall Auction. A friend of mine bought this armor from here about 10 years ago. Would you be able to tell me who originally owned it? This armor, it's quite old. It was sold from a church. Can you give me the address? To the church. It was around 6 p.m. when Christine reached the church. But from what it seemed, it was closed. Abandoned, in fact. Christine made her way in and stepped into the old house. Nobody's here. Now what do I do? Who are you searching for, child? Christine flinched to a voice behind her. She turned to look at an old man walk her way. Oh, I thought this place was abandoned. All but for me. I'm the caretaker. Christine took out the picture of the armor. I heard this armor once belonged here. I was wondering to who? Taking the picture, the old man fell silent before he said, Priest Philip and his family. May I meet them? Come with me. The old man took Christine out behind the church. They walked down the path not covered by the forest until they stopped at an old burnt down house. This used to be their home. It was almost 30 years ago. Priest Philip used to work at this church while he lived in this quarter. The clergy members all respected him and looked up to him, and so did the townspeople. But there was something about Priest Philip that no one knew. What is a woman doing with him? Priest Philip is married? But Priest Philip was not only married, but he also had a child. Knowing the rules of the church, he kept his family hidden. But it was one day his secret became exposed. This is a disgrace. Philip has disgraced us. What do we do? Dismiss him from the church? No, we have to get rid of them before the people find out. The clergy decided to take the life of priest Philip and his family. Get out, Philip. I'll try to handle them. Hide with John. But when Philip opened the door that night, trying to reason with them, the men all barged in. Anna, his wife, quickly hid her little boy in the armoire. Hide here, okay, Johnny? Don't come out unless you hear my voice. But mommy, I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be alone. It's all right. Lay down on this pillow and take a nap. Where is that vile woman? Please, don't harm her. We'll leave from here. We'll leave this town. You deserve death. That night, the clergymen took the life of priest Philip and his wife, rid their bodies, and set his house on fire. I used to work here as a caretaker back in those days. I witnessed what happened, but I couldn't do it. I witnessed what there's a fire in the church. 
There's a fire! By the time the folk nearby rushed to set it out, it was too late. There's a child in here! John had passed away in the armor, too afraid to come out. No one knew what happened to Priest Philip, but with him gone, people stopped coming to the church, and eventually, the church was closed and his things were auctioned off. But what brings you here, child? To return something that belongs here. It was almost 10 at night, but Christine immediately returned to Harold's. Christine, what are you doing here at this time? Harold, I know what happened with Valerie. You know nothing. Go home, Christine. Harold, listen to me. Your daughter is trapped. What are you talking about? After Harold listened to everything Christine had to say that night, he was shocked. What do we have to do? Return him home, so your daughter can return home. So that night, Harold and Christine took the armor back to the church, back to the burnt house. You don't have to be alone anymore. Click on the subscribe button and check out more awesome videos on our channel. And don't forget to press the bell icon because you know it's interesting. Alyssa Cole and Gail Brennan were location scouts at the BII Film Production Studios in New Zealand. They had recently been hired by an advertisement company who wanted to shoot a commercial at a picturesque and scenic location. So Alyssa and Gail got to work, searching various locations throughout the country. When Alyssa pitched the idea of checking out the small town of Lake Tecapo. She had been there a long time ago. The location was surrounded by mountain ranges, was known for its beautiful lake and exotic flowers, Sounds like our perfect honeymooning destination, I'm in. Our honeymooning destination? Stop dreaming, Gail. Well, I'm not a photographer, but I can already picture us there, together. You know when I first started working here, I knew you were going to be trouble. What? Then something must have went wrong. Hold on, let me walk by again. And this time, Alyssa, focus on me, okay? We're aiming on achieving love at first sight. Alyssa shook her head, letting out a chuckle. You're such an idiot. Everything about her job was exciting and awesome. Except for Gail. It wasn't that he wasn't a good guy. He was nice, he had money, even decent looking. But he was head over heels for Alyssa, a young woman who wasn't looking to date right now. Alyssa and Gail tried to look up a place to lodge by the mountains in Tecapo, but the town was quite rural. So Alyssa spoke to a friend of hers, Jack, who worked for the company's management. Hey Jack, Gail and I were looking for a place to lodge while we check out the location, but the place is so rural, we couldn't find any hotels there. Alright, I'll speak to the management and see if I can arrange something for you. So Jack arranged for them to stay at a farm ranch in Tecapo. 
So Alyssa and Gail headed out on their six hours journey from Blenheim to the small town of Tecapo. I'll drive. You look really tired, Alyssa. I know last night was tough on you. You've been running through my mind for hours. How do you come up with these cheesy pickup lines, Gail? All right, stop at the next gas station and know you're not paying and I don't want to hear it. I hope you're gonna keep things like that after we get married too. Marry? Us? We won't even get near dating in a million years. As Alyssa sat there beside Gail blabbering on and on from the minute they started the car, she knew this was going to be one long, long drive. But fortunately, Alyssa was able to doze off a bit until Gail suddenly started shouting at her to wake up. Alyssa! Alyssa! What happened? Is everything alright? Do you have a map on you? Yeah, don't tell me we're lost. Gail, you're good for nothing. Hold on, I'll put my GPS on the phone. Thanks, cuz I was about to say, I think I got lost in your eyes. We've just entered Tecapo, Cranky. Gail, you have to stop fooling around. Alyssa shrugged when suddenly she saw something up ahead. Stop the car, Gail. There's something on the road. What? Gail pressed hard on the brakes. They had stopped midway on a small bridge entering into Tecapo. What is that thing? Alyssa got out of the car to inspect what was laying in their way. She was shocked to see it was a cadaver of a mountain goat. How did this get here? She said, scrunching her nose. She suddenly jumped back, to seeing maggots and worms oozing out of the animal. Hey, are you alright? I'm alright, but this is so horrible. What animal is this? Looks like a mountain goat. If we drove over this, we definitely would have had an accident. The bigger question is, who drove over the animal and left it here in the first place? Thanks, Gail. Thanks for giving me nightmares. Hey, if you don't have nightmares, then how am I supposed to cuddle with you at night? Don't even think about it. It was within 20 minutes that they arrived at the ranch. You must be Miss Alyssa Cole. I'm Kaya Hart, the caretaker here. Good morning, Kaya. This is my co-worker, Gail Brennan. This ranch is sweet, and the scenery, I can watch it for hours. I'm pretty sure we're gonna settle on this one, Alyssa. You'll also enjoy the lakeside. It's the time of the year the flowers are blooming. Wow, looks like we made it on the right time then. By the way, Kaya, I was just wondering, are there also a lot of goats around here in these farmlands? We would have arrived earlier if we didn't have to stop at the bridge we found the cadaver of a goat on the road. The look on Kaya's face suddenly changed. A goat? Yes, you don't believe me, do you? It was quite a disturbing discovery. Kaya started shaking her head with worry. This is a sign of bad luck, Miss Cole. It's the sign of the goat man. Goat man? Gail chuckled. What's the goat man? It's not a matter of joke, Miss Cole. It's the legend of the Goat Man. Everyone living around here is well aware of it and its consequences. A long, long time ago, there was a man who lived in this town. The people didn't like him because he was known to be leecherous and lewd and had cynical tendencies. The townspeople all recognized who he was in one instance his disheveled hair, goatee beard, and crooked ears. He was lanky and tall. People used to mock him and called him Goat Man. The women resented him for his unattractive appearance, often complaining about him harassing them. And it was one day that he was alleged of taking advantage of one of the young women who happened to be the daughter of an influential man. That's when the townspeople went out to hunt the man down and bring him in for justice. However, what resulted from the angry mob ended up being a reason the town was to be haunted. The man died in the mayhem. He wasn't taken to the graveyard, but rather out in the open fields where he was buried. And the next day, the bypassers found the grave disturbed, dirt scattered around, 
a putrid odor emanating from it, and the body of the goat man missing. No one was able to find it, and it's since then that these horrible things have been occurring in this town. Seeing signs of the goat man is a curse of impending doom. The goat man fools and deceives his prey, until the point his prey is completely oblivious of the upcoming dangers, and when they realize it's too late for rescue. Women have gone missing, their remains have later been found violated, snatched of their innocence, and then murdered. This is a legend, right? Have these crimes actually occurred? Yes, Mr. Brennan. I've seen a young woman in that condition myself. This is why we don't let our families out alone or after sunset. And the townspeople think the goat man is behind it. Are you sure there isn't just another criminal out on the loose? Which is more probable? What do the police have to say? Or does the BIIPD also believe in the goat man? Gail smirked. The police have never been able to do anything. This is not something you can escape. It's a curse. People have seen him. The goat man. He has been raised from the dead, ravaging through the town, taking revenge for his untimely death. He was wicked in life, and now even more so after death. Miss Cole, I only tell you this to warn you. Stay safe. Alyssa and Gail enjoyed the little horror story they heard from the housekeeper, but they obviously didn't believe any of it. After freshening up, the two went out to walk around the area. The mountain ranges were about an hour's walk away, but the scenery was simply gorgeous. Alyssa and Gail started walking through the rocky mountain grounds, taking pictures for their portfolio. However, Alyssa kept looking behind her upon every sound, every snapping twig and dry leaf. Don't tell me she scared you. Well, this place is a whole lot creepier now that we know the legend that haunts everyone here. And now I wish I threw that rotting goat's horn on you. It's just a ridiculous urban legend. Let me repeat, legend. Forget it. Come on, there's a waterfall up ahead. Let's check that out today. After taking many shots of the location, Alyssa and Gail returned to the ranch house after sunset. Kaya had prepared food and cleaned the bedrooms for them. Miss Cole, I'll be heading home now. I'll be back tomorrow morning. You have to leave already? Why don't you join us for dinner? Thank you, Miss Cole, but I have to get home. It'll be sunset soon. After Kaya took leave, Alyssa and Gail had their dinner and went to bed early, preparing to explore more of the area the next day. The night went by peacefully in the secluded town tucked in the mountains, nothing but the sound of the nature, the winds, the crickets chirping. But come early the next morning, at the peak of dawn, <coughs> Alyssa and Gail both rushed out of their rooms to a piercing cry. They found Kaya running inside, shivering in fear. What happened, Kaya? The curse of the goat man has begun. The dog, the dog outside, it's... Gail walked out to the porch, bewildered by Kaya's condition. He was shocked to see a trail of blood that led out to the remains of the animal. It looked like something had dragged the stray dog across the fields. Its flesh was torn, chunks bitten off. How could this happen? Are there coyotes around here? No, Mr. Brennan. This was no coyote. This is another sign of the goat man's curse. Miss Cole, it is you I fear for. Young women have fell victim to the goat man. What if... what if something happens to you? Kaya, you're overreacting. We'll be fine. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Miss Cole, but I can't stay here any longer. Kaya, wait! But Kaya was too petrified to even speak. She dropped the house keys onto the counter, pleading with her hands before she ran out the door. Feeling a little awkward and creeped out being left alone in this ranch, Alyssa called up Jack and told him what happened. I really apologize about what happened. 
Kaya is usually very hospitable. I don't understand why she behaved like that. But now what? I don't know if I'll be able to arrange another housekeeper so soon. It's all right, Jack. Gail and I don't plan to stay here longer either. I'll lock the place up and when I'm back, I'll come by your place and drop off the keys. After breakfast, Alyssa and Gail hiked up to the top of the mountains where they took some more pictures. They would wrap up on work today and perhaps leave tomorrow. It was around 9 p.m. the two returned to the ranch. They sat down to look over the pictures of the sites they had selected. This is the perfect place to shoot the commercial. Mountains and a lake in the background, the flower fields. What do you think, Alyssa? Alyssa suddenly noticed something in the pictures. She scrolled through all of them, focusing on a strange shadowy figure in each one. Alyssa widened her eyes, dropping the camera. Gail, tell me you don't see that. See what? Come on, Alyssa, don't be silly. Now the rumors are getting to your head. How is it in every picture? It's behind us in this one. It's just the shadows of the trees. Suddenly, the two heard a noise outside. Alyssa hurried to the windows and peered outside. Nothing but the swaying tall grasses in the field. Don't worry, I'm with you right here. I can stay in your room tonight. Alyssa pushed Gail aside as he walked up behind her. You don't know when to stop, do you? This isn't funny. Who said I was joking? A little fun can help change your mood now, can't it? Alyssa started to feel uncomfortable by the way Gail was eyeing her. Gail, you're just crossing the line now. You know I'm not interested, so just back off already. I'm going to bed. She said before she stormed off to her room. But just before she locked the door, she peered out and shouted down the hall. Make sure you keep your windows locked. The first half of the night went by tossing and turning to strange noises outside. Until Alyssa finally went to sleep. But hearing some strange noises sometime before dawn, Alyssa woke up again. She went out to see the matter, but she found Gail's bedroom empty and couldn't find him anywhere else in the house. And when she found his phone laying on the ground in his room, she started to panic. Did something horrible happen? Was Kaya right all along? Alyssa hurried out to search for him, when suddenly she spotted him far out on the field, just sitting there in the tall grass. Alyssa ran to him, panting. What happened to you? What are you doing out here? You scared me! Alyssa was a little shocked by Gail's silence. He didn't even look at her. Was he avoiding her now? Had she been a bit too harsh the night before? Gail? Some noises woke me up. Then I came out. The weather was nice. I thought I heard something too. Come on, let's go inside. How long have you been out here? Why? Did you miss me? Well, I never said I don't care for you. Without saying anything, Gail got up and walked back inside while Alyssa followed after him. Are you upset with me or something? Gail chuckled as he went inside. Alyssa watched him lock the door, standing there with his back to hers. She could see the smirk on his face. What's so funny, Gail? Why are you behaving so strange? You couldn't sleep thinking about me, could you? What? That's how they all fall into my clutches. They hear about me. They spot me. They want to find me. What they don't know is that it's I who finds them. What are you talking about? Are you scared of the goat man, Alyssa? The next day, Kaya returned with a few other people worried about the guests she had left behind. She was horrified when she found Gail unconscious out in the fields, all his clothes torn, and Alyssa was nowhere to be seen. Gail was taken to the local hospital while police set out in search for Alyssa Cole. They let out a canine unit and after a long search throughout the whole morning, they finally found her remains high up in the mountains. 
but they were bewildered by her condition. She had been taken advantage of, bruises, marks all over her body, and strange as it was, they were all made by teeth. The woman was bitten all over. Alyssa Cole's remains were immediately sent to the forensic lab, while the police awaited to question the surviving victim, or the culprit himself, Gail. Officer, officer, the results have come in, but this doesn't make sense at all. The bites on the woman weren't made by a human, it was an animal. The DNA found on her body, however, was that of Gail Brennan's. What happened over there? Where were you? I don't know, I was in my room. Did you not even hear her screams? The last thing I remember is going outside in the middle of the night to some strange noises. I don't know what happened. Click on the subscribe button and check out more awesome videos on our channel. And don't forget to press the bell icon because you know it's interesting. everything. Things can't go on like this. Claire. Claire? You're here at this time? Where's Gavin? Did you come here all alone? Mom, Gavin has been unfaithful to me. Claire and Gavin have been married for four years now, and Claire is pregnant with their first child. Gavin has his own business, and every now and then, he has to take long trips abroad for work. But ever since Gavin returned from his last trip, Claire noticed how odd he had been behaving. It all started with the insomnia, then the weight loss. But what bothered Claire the most was how he was keeping away from her. At first, Claire thought he was exhausted from his trip. She thought he was stressed about something with work, but Gavin was simply avoiding her. Gavin, did everything go well on your business trip? Yes, it was fine. You've been looking a little stressed, is everything alright? I just, I just need some time alone. It wasn't only that Gavin was staying away from her, but it seemed that he was surprised or startled by her presence. And sometimes, it even seemed as if he were frightened by her. In fact, one night, when Claire thought she would spend some time with him to help him open up and get some relief, Gavin pushed her away. Get away from me. Gavin, what's wrong? Why are you being like this? Claire couldn't mistake the look of fright in Gavin's eyes. She just didn't understand what he was so afraid of. It seemed like he wanted to tell her something, but he was hesitant. 
but tonight, he finally confessed. He had been unfaithful to her. Claire felt so shattered and betrayed. She didn't have words for him. For the moment, she just needed to get away. So she packed her bags and went to her mother's place. All men are pigs, Claire. You think your father was a good man? You know how many times he had been unfaithful to me and lied about it? Gavin at least had the decency to confess to you. Perhaps he's feeling guilty and he wants to change. But why now? Do you think it's because I'm pregnant? From my experience and whatever I've observed, men become more unfaithful during a woman's pregnancy and more so after childbirth. I really don't know what to think, Mom. He could have hidden all this from me. Why confess all of a sudden? Claire, if you forgive him, then you'll be living with the cheat. But if you leave him, what are you going to do? Be alone your whole life? You might find someone else, but there's no guarantee he won't cheat on you. Or he'll be better than Gavin. What should I do? With Claire gone, the house was so empty and silent. Gavin felt so heartbroken and devastated. He was tormented by his guilt. He didn't know how much longer he could take this. Suddenly hearing a faint noise in the room, Gavin turned around hoping Claire had returned. But there was no one. But as he stared into the darkness, he suddenly heard that noise again. From the far corner, he noticed the darkness begin to stir as she stepped out. His heart raced as she walked towards him. What do you want from me? I thought you wanted me. Gavin and Claire's relationship had always been close. He truly loved her. But since Claire had gotten pregnant, they hadn't been spending much time together and had become a little distant. In all this, Gavin was set for another one of his business trips out of the country for a few days. He booked into a small motel by the shore a bit secluded from town, hoping for some privacy. Welcome to Seaside Motel. Here's the keys to your room. We don't have room service here, but the cafeteria is open till 10, where you can have your meals. And if you need anything else, feel free to call the reception. Thank you. By the time Gavin wrapped up on work and returned to the motel, it was around 6 p.m. every day. In the evening, the weather would be calm and soothing, and he would walk out towards the cliffside to relax. That was where he noticed a young woman sitting in the same place every evening. She was beautiful. And sometimes, Gavin caught himself staring at her. And one day, she did too. Were you looking at me? Sorry, I didn't want to make you feel uncomfortable. No, it's okay. I don't mind a little company. I'm Miranda. You? Gavin. You don't look like you're from around here. I was here on a business trip, staying at the motel just down the shore. The Seaside Motel? I work there. That evening, Gavin and Miranda spoke for hours sitting by the cliffside. It's getting dark, I should get going. Weren't you enjoying spending time here? Yes, but I have work, I should really go. Gavin bid her farewell and returned to the motel for the night. It had begun to rain 
and listening to the droplets hit the ceiling. Gavin soon fell asleep. But sometime into the night, he woke up hearing a noise. Opening his eyes, he realized there was someone in the room. Miranda, what are you doing here? You think I didn't understand what you wanted? The way you were looking at me, the way you were talking to me. You almost escaped from there because you were afraid you would end up doing something, end up giving up to your desires. What are you saying? It's okay, I want you to. Miranda and Gavin spent the night together. But the next morning, when Gavin woke up, the bed lay empty beside him. As the previous night flashed before his eyes, he felt the guilt weigh him down. What have I done? How will I tell Claire? Gavin decided he would leave that very day. But before he did, he wanted to meet Miranda last time. But where would he find her? Mr. White, is there anything I can help you with? Hello, is Miranda here today? Miranda? Who? She told me she works here. She has long brown hair, green eyes. The man looked at Gavin Strange as he took out a picture from the drawer and showed him. Do you mean her? Yes, this is her. What? That can't be. It's not possible. Miranda is no more. Some years ago, a young woman named Miranda used to work at the seaside motel. She was a beautiful woman. Oftentimes, Many of the customers that lodged at the motel would try to talk to her, desperately wanting a chance to spend time with the beautiful woman. And Miranda too used to seduce them, to take advantage of them. However, one of these days, things got out of her hand when she tried to blackmail one of the men. And in rage, he threw her off the cliffside. Miranda's body was discovered two days later, washed up on the shore. No one knew what happened to her, or how, but it was ever since then, people around here have seen her spirit lurking amongst them. They found her body years ago, on the shore. Take a look. The elderly man opened up the piece of paper showing Gavin the news report of Miranda's demise. Gavin fell in shock, not knowing what to believe. But he knew he had to leave. And so, he packed his bags and returned home that very night. He wanted to forget everything that happened. But when he saw Claire, that night flashed before his eyes. He couldn't forget what he had done, and the guilt tormented him. And in all this, one night, while he lay in bed with Claire, he woke up, noticing someone standing by the edge of his bed. It was Miranda. Miranda? It... It can't be. You, you have to go. My wife is here. When Gavin turned to look at Claire, he was horrified when he saw Miranda. Oh, 
This can't be real. Gavin felt like he was losing his mind, and things came to the point where he couldn't tell what was real and what was not. Whenever Clara came to him, he saw Miranda. And that night, when Clara came to console him, thinking it was Miranda, he pushed her away, almost hurting her. Gavin was devastated by what happened. He knew things couldn't go on like this, and perhaps the only way he could escape this guilt was through confession. I'm sorry, Claire. I lost control. I fell to the temptation. I've been unfaithful to you. Gavin couldn't tell Claire everything, fearing she wouldn't believe him, and no one would believe what happened with him. Now, you will live with your demon. A few days had gone by since Claire had left the house, when she got a call from one of Gavin's colleagues. Claire? Where is Gavin? He hasn't come to work in the past few days. He's not picking up any calls. Is everything all right? What? He hasn't gone to work? Claire felt a bit concerned when she called the house and no one picked up. So she decided to go back and check up on Gavin. That night, when she opened the door, she found the house pitch dark. Stepping inside, she tried turning on the lights, but the electricity wasn't working. Gavin? Gavin, are you there? It was silent. Finding her way through the darkness, Claire took out a candle from the cupboard and lit it. Gavin! She slowly walked towards their bedroom. A cool breeze blew in as she tried to cover the flame. The window was left open. But when Claire stepped inside, she was shocked to see Gavin slumped over on the table. Rushing to him, she checked his pulse. He was unconscious. Gavin, wake up, Gavin! But Gavin was irresponsive. Claire immediately picked up the phone to call for help, but there was no connection. That's when she noticed, on the table, a letter written in his handwriting. Claire fell in shock as he read everything that happened with Gavin on his trip, about Miranda, about that night. But as she finished reading the letter, A sudden chill surrounded her as the room became cold and the flame blew out. As she shivered, Claire suddenly saw something shift to the corner of the room. <laughs> she froze, hearing a faint laughter as a woman stepped out.
You came here to save him? Do you know what he did with me? How he made love to me? How he loved my body? As Miranda approached her, Claire fell back in fright. She stared at her in awe. Until she gathered up her courage and got up. No. Who do you think you are? You're nothing but a seductress. You seduced him. You took advantage of him. You're not his wife. He didn't commit to you. He would never give his life for your honor and your security. He is my husband, and this is my house. And I banish you from my house. As soon as Claire uttered the words, Miranda vanished. The eerie chill around her slowly lessened. The strange presence no longer lingered in the room. It was over. Claire immediately ran out to the phone booth down the street and called for help. 911, what's your emergency? I need an ambulance right now. How are you feeling? Better. All this time, you couldn't have told me about the ghost. You didn't cheat, you were possessed. Whatever you saw, whatever you felt, it was all a delusion, a haunting. I thought you wouldn't believe me. I couldn't believe it. You know I'll always be by your side. Click on the subscribe button and check out more awesome videos on our channel. And don't forget to press the bell icon because you know it's interesting.